Welcome back to Monroe Live, everybody. Today I have Jordan Rocha and Kevin Hardy, and we're gonna do the hoist review of the RAV4. Now, this is a RAV4 PHEV, so there's a lot to look at, and we're gonna go ahead and get started. Now, Jordan, why don't you go ahead and kick us off? What do you first notice? Yeah, so just a couple small things. So looking underneath the vehicle at some of the major architecture items, the cradle specifically, um, you'll notice this painted bracket mounted to the underside of the gearbox. You might think, well, it looks super out of place, and it does in some ways, but what we believe this to be looking at it, especially relative to where it is on the cradle, is that during an impact event, this bracket is probably helping connect the gearbox to the cradle um, during the initial portion of the event so that this whole gearbox doesn't sort of skip right over the cradle and head towards the dash panel. So it's helping the cradle absorb some of that energy coming forward in the vehicle. And then as you sort of follow that energy train backwards, you'll see some of the major skid plates on the underside of the vehicle, namely this one, have sort of this like keyed or slotted feature. So what that's gonna do during the impact more than likely is allow this plate to sh shear off or separate from these bolts so that you're not loading up the whole underside of the battery pack. So they're trying to terminate that energy transfer um, much further forward relative to the pack. Um, and this bracket is enabling that effect. Now, if you remember when we looked at the Kia and the Hyundai, they had a simple K-frame. And what a K-frame is, is it's this, only this rear portion of the cradle. Toyotas, their previous D platform, and now the new TNGA, and this is TNGA-K, have a full perimeter, full perimeter cradle. So that pulls the steel all the way up to the front. This is more typical to what we saw in the 2010 to 2015 Toyota platforms, but they are hard mounting this cradle, and in the, in the past they had had isolated front cradles. Also, the width has grown <coughs> to help with the sorb test i know that we've covered the sorb test multiple times the small overlap rigid barrier mm -hmm. um, the width is really critical in starting the absorption right here and you can see that they have this aluminum bracket right here and this is actually for pedestrian protection so if you get you know hit at low speeds they want this to be supported so that when it hits your ankle it, it actually flips you forward and um, I know, Jordan, you have some experience there. If you have sharper or pointed objects down here, that could be bad for pedestrian protection. Yeah, that's, that's true, not just in the front of the vehicle, but in the top of the hood as well. So they'll actually produce like a heat map, for lack of a better term, for PedPro, identifying areas on the top surface of the hood that were, you know, quote unquote, like hard points, things that would negatively impact um, a pedestrian in the event of an impact like that. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's an enabler for sure. Um, the suspension ar architecture is we typically see from Toyota, a McPherson strut with a stamped steel lower control arm, clamshell style, serviceable, serviceable ball joint. So the ball joint assembly can be unbolted from the the lower control arm itself, and you can replace just that ball joint later, later in life. A very tight and compact uh, forged knuckle with only three bolts securing the, uh, four bolts securing the hub to the knuckle. I know we saw three on the, the Kias. Yeah. Um, Toyota's never one to, to sort of just brush over the details. So to that end, if you, if you look right here, one of the things that we always like to see is when people take note of like really dedicated paint cutting threads. So uh, these points are where the lower control arm is mounting down through the cradle. And likely because it's going through a hole, right? As this subframe goes through paint, there's a high propensity for an enclosed cylinder like that to collect extra paint residue. And so they're making a very concerted effort with a bolt head like that to make sure that as you start to run those fasteners down, you've got a, a method of sort of clearing those threads before you actually want to engage the threads that will ultimately hold the control arm in place. So good attention to detail there. Before we move any farther back in the vehicle, I'd be remiss if we didn't at least talk about the 
the scalloping and the castleization on the body structure, at least you can see here for the lower you know, front portion of the, uh, the cooling module. This, uh, if you want to bring the camera down, you kind of bring the attention here. So if you follow across the top here, you'll see that nothing is straight. Essentially, the material is being pushed out everywhere. They have a spot weld and only where they have spot welds. And Toyota's been known for having pretty small spot welding flanges um, in general. So just less material, less weight. The, ca the, the castleization that you see here, these relief help panels nest together and also moisture and like and, and just uh, water in general clear from the body structure to help reduce corrosion in general but uh, this helps uh, with light weighting and you, and a lot of these pacific oems do you know very high capital investment small stamp body structures uh, it's, it's a very prominent feature and you can kind of see some of the layering you know exhibited here you don't get to see it through a lot of the other parts of the body structure and if we did a complete tear down this vehicle you be able to see it, but you start to see more use of similar strategies on some of the newer GM platforms and, uh, and some of the other vehicles on the domestic side uh, here recently. Yeah, Toyota is also very good about reusing components on their high runner vehicles as well as their low runner vehicles. And if you can notice this hump right here on the cradle, so uh, having studied dozens of Toyotas in the past, we've seen a cradle that's utilized where the exhaust will flow underneath, maybe on their high runner V6 or a high runner uh, version of a, of a powertrain option, but this is a low runner and it has the exhaust flowing over the cradle, but you notice this hump still exists because they're reusing that. And that's actually not always the case. Uh, many times a PHEV like this will be much heavier and they'll have to increase the, the size or strength of the cradle to, to match the car, but they think through all their variants and that is a, a trait that we've seen in, mo in many of our past studies that we've done. Additionally, on the underside, one thing that we always like to point out when we see examples of this is some cross-functional integration. So they took the O2 sensor harness right here and they snapped it into the bracket, which is retaining one of the high voltage cable runs. So that tells us that the high voltage guy was talking to the exhaust and or low voltage guy so a little detail but interesting and at the plant level if you look at this large stamped steel weldment this has the battery and much of the high voltage electronics on it it's hard mounted to the body but what we found in other oems they struggle with line side spacing or overhead spacing because that's a very limited section of many plants so this most likely is built up offline where the assembly workers can put all the components, make many of the connections, and this will be decked. Oftentimes, it could also be decked with the front and rear suspension. So just like exhaust and fuel system are oftentimes decked with front and rear cradles and suspension, uh, my guess is if I looked at some plant shots of this TNGA architecture, this would most likely be sitting on the pallet before it's decked vertically. Yeah. Yeah, as you move, rearward in the vehicle, something that's very characteristic of a plug-in hybrid vehicle. If you start looking at the fuel tank, you might say, wow, there's a lot of stuff around the fuel tank. There's foam on the top, there's foam on the bottom covered up by another plastic shield. But what's hard to see is that this is actually a steel tank. So if, if you've never seen, if you have not seen a lot of PHEVs, you might not take note of the fact that most PHEVs out there are steel tanks versus um, a multi-layer um, HDPE tank, for example, so like a high-density polyethylene. They do that because the PHEVs are unique in that they may have long periods of time, especially in an urban environment, where you may not actually engage the ICE motor at all. Um, you may be able to run purely on battery, plug in in between drives, and you may never need to use it. But the negative side effect to that is you may get excessive pressure buildup in the tank. And from an emissions perspective, the steel tank helps mitigate those um, additional losses or from keeping the tank from uh, sort of collapsing in on itself like a HDPE may. Now this being a PHEV, the rear drive unit is what we call P4. So it's completely separate from any other driveline components, high voltage, uh, electricity is sent to it on this side. Now because it's primarily a front-wheel drive architecture, um, there is an electric motor, uh, multiple electric motors, or it's a generator in the, the prime system. 
Um, this essentially makes it all-wheel drive, and I don't know what the power output of the rear unit is, but sometimes it can be as low as 50, 80, 90 horsepower, because what you're doing is you're adding this to the whole front-end system. Uh, the rear suspension is a, we call this a twist blade, and there's three bolts on each side to a complex forging. This is also very similar to what we saw on both of those a Hyundai, the Hyundai, and the Kia. Um, but a very basic suspension architecture. Is there anything you see, Kevin? Well, as far as the suspension, we were talking a little bit before about the shock color. So we were wondering if essentially they're painted red, which you can see here to help delineate, you know, when these, these parts are coming on the line between a PHEV and an ICE version. Um, it's hard to know for sure for some quality marks in the front of the vehicle. We did see some red marks in some of the front coil springs. I don't see any here, so it could just be indicative of a, a quality check there versus an overall strategy that they are deliberately marking, you know, certain suspension components as red for the PHEV variant. Um, but, you know, many OEMs um, who take pride in either certain ride height capabilities or things of that nature will have numerous sets of springs uh, for various trim levels. So it's just something that we kind of keyed in on. And then uh, with respect to, I feel for Chris, I have to at least mention it, on the exhaust here, uh, Toyota has for years had you know, hollow exhaust hangers. They've always been extremely weight efficient and it's kind of uh, in line with their consideration of where they, they place some, um, some emphasis. So they, they do have a lot on weight. Many of other customers struggle to implement something like this because they have extremely high corrosion, internal standards for corrosion and essentially for their, uh, for their requirements, you know, a strategy like Toyota would not be, would not be up to their uh, vehicle uh, longevity requirements. So they cannot do something as simple as this and they end up paying a weight, a weight penalty and cost penalty for material throughout the entire exhaust system for the life of the car. One other thing that caught our eye when looking at the underside of the vehicle, which no OEM is without these types of examples, but this is a ride height sensor. Um, so depending on the suspension type or the vehicle application, ride height sensors will be used for any number of uh, things or applications as an input. Um, but what you see for the linkage is this little cast aluminum bar and then a bar that goes inside the main lower control arm and it is indexed. And then you go up and you've got another bracket holding the sensor itself mounted to another bracket going to a bracket for the top of the cradle. So a bracket with a bracket and then another bracket is typically not a optimized strategy. But once again, um, this is probably because they have a control arm from either a past architecture or one that shared across multiple platforms. And this may just not have been part of the package to start with. And even though you see the same marks on the other one, the sensor will only be on one side. And when you go to the right front, most likely the sensor's on the right front. And this is also an input that they can use for whether or not the car is rolling uh, for stability control. Um, more, tip more typically, we'd see it on vehicles with ride height, um, partic particularly the air systems. But And Jordan was just pointing out how crazy the amount of pieces we have here. And in the same general area, we have essentially arrow flickers here on the rear control arm. So um, a lot of vehicles will often have something similar to this that sleeves over the entire control arm, depending on the material that they're made out of, whether they're cast aluminum, extruded aluminum, and then stamped or whatnot. Here we have a, just a stamped steel kind of clamshell set up. But there is no leading edge to this, just a, a profile here that comes off, which suggests that it's, it's not for, you know, obviously it's on the backside, but there's no stone impingement protection. So the focal point here is likely aerodynamics um, or potentially NVH. They might have some noise coming off of, um, some parts of the, the undercarriage and then they use, um, I didn't see this with the aero shields on, but um, that just kind of tells us its functional purpose is derived mostly within probably aerodynamics or NVH versus um, corrosion mitigation uh, or anything like that, that we often see shields on control arms for. So Toyota provided us this vehicle uh, through their press fleet and as a company, Monroe & Associates has torn down, it has to be well over well over 65 Toyotas for me, because I know I did a study for a client back in 2006 where we tore down every single Toyota or Lexus that was to in the fleet at the time. And one thing they always really excel in is continual improvement and quality. So if you buy a Toyota Camry, 
um, you can drive it to 250, 300,000 miles, no problem. Corolla is like the best selling car in the world. The Tundra, not the Tundra, the Tacoma is. <laughs> <laughs> nope, sorry. not the Tundra. The Tacoma is, you know, immensely popular around the world. And even the Hilux, right? Yes. Yeah. They're very an, similar. It's an incredible vehicle. So whether it's body on frame or the mass market vehicles, um, Toyota has always just been the benchmark that many OEMs are trying to emulate. And we've even seen Hyundai Motors uh, over the course of the past two decades really emulate a lot of what they do from their architecture perspective, material choices, and manufacturing methodology. And um, I know this is a PHEV. We try and do a lot of BEVs here. So the way that they integrate some of their high voltage components are average, mm -hmm. if not basic. Um, but we're always impressed to see the level of refinement underneath a Toyota. And I don't know, Jordan or Kevin, you have anything to add? No, I mean, I think you said it all. It's just, it's proven. They evolutionize their stuff over unit time and um, they work out a lot of bugs as a result. Yeah, I mean, the only thing with regards to Toyotas is, especially like with the Tacoma, you're never typically going to see, you know, rapid change or innovation. And a lot of people from a value proposition would, I don't want to say there's not a lot of value in a Toyota vehicle, but when you look at some aspects of what type of content or technology, you know, not obviously there's not a mixed material body structure here. There's very, you know, little aluminum. There's a lot of other OEMs that, that offer quite a bit of technology and improvement in their vehicles where here you see essentially like, tried and true and proven processes. And they do do great process control. Um, there's some other people that you know, work here that have you know, done some, um, that are familiar with essentially how they trend and track with body build up and things of that nature. And they can attest to the quality that goes into the, the constant monitoring of how they build things up. But uh, it's a, an interesting value proposition specifically for some other vehicles when it's with their competitive segments. You, you may not get the, the bleeding edge of anything and you very rarely will see it in some of these vehicles. You'll typically find new processes that they're trying out on some of the Lexuses, and then you'll see it, you know, two or three years later sure, on, yeah. yep, yeah. On, the, uh, on the Toyota line, so. Uh, a couple updates on the channel. Sandy is back tomorrow, so I've been bringing in different people to take a look at this. So Sandy will take a look at this before it heads out. Um, the Model S Plaid is coming. I know I updated it in the last video. I'm just saving us a little bit of time because I see it in the questions all the time, people asking when the Plaid is coming. It's just been delayed because we ordered it through Tesla. And also there is a fundraiser that we're supporting, the American Breast Cancer Society. Uh, there is an auction for a tour of Monroe and Associates and lunch with Sandy Monroe. Um, that is currently a live auction. We'll put the link in the description. Look for it there if you want to help out a good cause and bid for that. Um, other than that, thanks for tuning in. We appreciate it. Bye.